Welcome to Numerical Methods. So we uh, started a section on random number generation. Yeah, in the background is still our application of Monte Carlo integration so that we can approximate, say, the expectation or in this special case, an integral by taking a sequence of, say, for example, uniform random numbers, plugging it into a function. And we had this nice little uh, theorem on the convergence rate. So this here on the left is our Monte Carlo approximation. Just plug in the sequence of here random variables in then in the computer, the random numbers, so random variables evaluated at a single event. Plug this in into the function, take the average, and this is a fairly good approximation for the integral over this domain. The convergence rate was one divided by square root of number of sample points. Yeah. Not too good. Yeah, We saw classical integration rules that have a far better uh, convergence rate. Also, the effect was the convergence only holds in probability. Because we have a sequence of IID random variables here. And the really strange thing was that we applied this method by using a single event. So actually, we don't know a lot about our approximation accuracy. But the very surprising thing is that the dimension of the function does not enter into this estimate. So the Monte Carlo method really has an advantage in higher dimension where classical integration is becoming worse. Yeah, we applied this method by yeah, plugging in here a single event omega yeah, to the capital Xi, so that was our little Xi, and that is our sequence of random numbers, and we were talking about random number generation. The interesting thing is that we are now moving to the Coxma-Lafka inequality, and this inequality actually removes the defect that we have this estimate only in probability. So as a little teaser, this is where we will arrive. So again, you see the deviation of our Monte Carlo approximation from the true integral. Uh, this can be estimated now by two properties. One is here the discrepancy, so a property of the sequence. So this takes the place of the one divided by square root of n. And the other one is, is the variation um, of the function. And you see there is no probability involved here. We already talked about the discrepancy in our previous session. So the discrepancy was a measure to characterize the distribution of the points. Yeah, for example, the discrepancy is large if we have larger regions where we have no points or if we have regions where we have maybe too many points. Yeah. So the discrepancy, just a short recapitulation, was measuring a little bit the difference between the, the percentage of points we observe in a certain interval, here from A to B, compared to the volume of this interval, so what we would expect yeah, as a percentage to observe in this interval. The interval is from the unit hypercube, yeah, so the full interval is has volume one is 100%. So we were measuring this deviation, yeah, and we take the absolute value, so uh, of course we have a high value if we are too low, if we have too few points in this interval, and we have a high value if you have too many points in this interval. And we take the supremum over all uh, possible such intervals. The star discrep discrepancy was a special case here below where we just take the 
check the intervals that have the left lower left endpoint attached to zero. And there was a small estimate that actually we can also use the star discrepancy. So that was maybe a small recapitulation also with the application of the Monte Carlo integral in the background. Um, we need another ingredient, and that is the variation of the function. Yeah, the variation of the function also entered into our probabilistic Monte Carlo convergence rate. Yeah? The variation of the function was here. There was this sigma. Yeah? So this here is our error bound. Yeah, All the stuff on the outside is just that it holds in probability. So we, we are bounding by sigma a property of the function multiplied with one divided by square root of n, a property of yeah, the sequence of the number of points we use. Well, why is sigma um, the variation of the function? Because sigma squared is the variance of f of xi. Uh, xi is a sequence of uniform distributed random variables, and I check the vari variance of f of xi, for example, if f is just a constant, uh, it maps all the elements from the unit hypercube to a constant, the variance is zero. Uh, it is the variation of the function that enters here. And we need this ingredients also here in our Cox-Malafka inequality, uh, really a remarkable step now. Yeah? We remove this uh, probabilistic nature and this is the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause. So the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause, maybe you recall variation of a function in one dimension. So in one dimension, what do you do here? You take the change of the function, so the first derivative, then you take the absolute value because you would like to measure you know, the variability, you know, so you don't care if it goes up or down. And then you integrate this over the whole domain. Yeah? So if you would have a function that looks, for example, like this, it goes up and then it goes down again and it goes up, then your variation is you know, taking this here, and then it's taking also, again, the movement that goes down. And then it takes, again, the movement that it goes up again. And then it takes, actually, the sum of the three. Yeah, So your variation will be this part plus this part plus this part. OK, so this is then the variation of the function in one dimension. We need this in higher dimensions. Yeah? Um, it is a property of the function. We need this in higher dimensions. So um, we like to generalize this concept to a function that maps from RD, yeah, or the unit hypercube, to R. So this is the other ingredients now in our cox malafka inequality, and here is the definition. So let f be a function that is sufficiently smooth. Yeah? So if the function is defined on Rd, or the unit hypercube 0, 1 to the power of d, then I need that the function is, for example, d times differentiable. And the variation v of f of this function in the sense of Hardy and Krause is now defined as, yeah, now comes a little bit clumsy notation. I take the sum over all variations V superscript K of the function uh, with some indices I1 to IK. Yeah, so you see that I1 to IK are indices that are between 1 and D, 
And I can have one such index, uh, two such index, uh, or three such indices. So I take the sum over all those um, uh, indices I1 to IK. Yeah, so actually, you could think that uh, you have D different indices, yeah, and uh, the indices could also be uh, zero. Yeah, so then this ind index is uh, not there. So for the indices that are not zero, or for the indices we have, so how do we define this uh, V superscript K? Yeah, this V superscript K is now defined a little bit like you know it from the one-dimensional case. Yeah? You take the case derivative, case derivative of the function F with respect to these um, elements, yeah, di1 up to dik, and take the absolute value and integrate uh, over these arguments that correspond to these indices. You integrate here or take the derivative of a function that is restricted to the indices yet that you have chosen before. And these indices that we have uh, chosen before, they are the three parameters. Uh, so the indices that we have chosen before define the three parameters of the functions. So this is the function f of xi, where xi is xi, and the other values are set to zero. Okay, so this looks now really... Uh, complicated. This looks now really strange. Maybe I give you a small intuition to this. First note, uh, for the one-dimensional case, this is exactly what you know. Yeah? For the one-dimensional case, the D will be 1. So you have one argument, x1. So this here means that i1 is between 1 and 1. So i1 is 1. So you have one index, which is one. So this means you restrict the function to its argument x1, but the function only depends on the argument x1. So the f restricted to i1 is just the f of xi. So the k is equals to one. This means you take the first derivative of the function with respect to this argument, and you integrate it with respect to this argument yeah, after having taken the absolute value. So this is exactly what happens in one dimension. What happens now in the more general case? Let's move to two dimensions. Let me maybe draw this here. Okay, so we are restricting our function to different components. Yeah? So let's assume that I first restrict to the index i1 being equal to 1. So this is k is 1. i1 is equal to 1. So then what I'm doing is I check the function f that only depends on x1. So f restricted to i1, which only depends on x1. I differentiate this guy with respect to x1. So this is now approximately, if I consider finite difference approximation, take f of x1, and now f was restricted to x1 and 0, shift the x1 component, so plus a delta x1. And I take the derivative, so subtract f of x1 and 0, divide by delta x, but then we also integrate with respect to delta x. So if we take the integral, so with respect to dx, dx1, then it's just, this is just a finite difference. Now, the same happens for uh, i1 being 2. 
No, I restrict to the second component. So recall here, my indices are between one and D, and now I'm in two dimension. My index can be now either one or two. And I just have one such index because K is equal to one. So for that, I have that we differentiate with respect to x2 and integrate with respect to x2. So this is just the finite difference that we observe in the direction of x2 when we keep x1 equal to zero. Now consider the case that we have k equals two. So I have two indices. Yeah, and we choose maybe I1 to be one and I2 to be two. So I have the second derivative with respect to x1, x2. And this is just also a finite difference approximation. Namely, take the function evaluation when you shift x1 and x2 minus take the function at the unshifted value, so x1 and x2. So you see that um, if you think in terms of physical units, say um, the function f is meter, a distance, and x is time, yeah, second. Then what you do here is you calculate meter per second and multiply with a time span, second. So you get something that has the unit meter, a length, yeah, and we sum up these lengths. Also here, yeah, you have meter per second squared, but you multiply it with two different time intervals, yeah, time second squared, you also have again the unit meter. So if you go to the definition, you see that here you really consistently always sum, always integrate uh, meters. So in if you like to draw a picture now that illustrates what is going on, I have the x1 component, I have the x2 component, and I'm measuring, well, the blue one is keep x2 fixed to zero, so you measure the variations here in this direction of the function. The green one is that you measure the variation in this direction of the function. And my red one was that I measure the variations in the diagonal direction. Well, for all combinations of x1, x2, yeah, so also all these guys here are measured, yeah? All the diagonal elements are measured. This is what the red one does. Yeah, and you see that if you now like to know the yeah, variation you observe from going from say here yeah uh, to to there you can you can go this way here yeah and you can measure the variation you see along this path so you see that uh, this is really maybe a generalization to what you classical think of your variation uh, to higher uh, dimension we are summing up all those combinations or um, so we are summing up all those small variations in the different directions, yeah? where these indices just say, okay, what is the direction in which we in which we move? <clears throat> okay, that looks ugly, yeah, but well, maybe it's a quite intuitive concept. And now we have the Cox Malafka inequality, the following holds the function f is given with bounded total variation on the unit hypercube in d dimensions. The 
sequence x1 up to xn is given, a sequence in the third unit hypercube. And then we have the estimate that the difference of our Monte Carlo approximation and the true integral in absolute value. So this can be bounded by the variation of the function multiplied with the discrepancy of the sequence. So a really remarkable uh, step now from here, where we still had this probability yeah, to, to here. So this one takes the role of the sigma, yeah, the square root of the variance of f of x, yeah, where x is a uniform distributed random variable. And this one takes, takes the role of our one divided by square root of n. Yeah, so now we have an obvious task. Yeah? Can we find sequences that have maybe a better discrepancy than one divided by square root of n? Well, you already know one. Yeah? If you place points evenly, yeah, an equipartitioning of the interval 0, 1, then, well, you have one point, every one divided by n uh, interval. Yeah? So this discrepancy, which is this zigzag curve, will be 1 divided by n, yeah? or order 1 divided by n, depending on where you placed your first point, left point, right point. So maybe we can create sequences that have even better discrepancy than a random, a random sequence. This motivates then the section, our section on low discrepancy sequences. Before we go there, let's uh, prove a few things. The bound in this inequality is sharp. So for any sequence x1 to xn and any given epsilon larger than zero, you can find a C infinity function, a smooth function with variation one, such that we have that the error we observe is larger than the discrepancy, the star discrepancy minus epsilon. Yeah? So also in the theorem, it was the star discrepancy. Also here it is the star discrepancy. So the bound is sharp in the sense that we can find a poorly performing function for a given sequence. That links a little bit back to my motivation where I was discussing yeah, the remarkable property of the Monte Carlo method that it does not depend on the dimension. Yeah. Uh, there, it was an argument that for classical integration rules where you have a Cartesian product, yeah, you can find a function yeah, where actually this discretization performs poorly. And the randomness was the way out yeah, um, because then there was zero probability that for a given function or well, that for a chosen function, the sequence uh, yeah, performs, uh, performs poorly in this sense. I can sketch the proof that the bound is sharp, and maybe this gives you a little bit intuition. Let's sketch this proof for the case of being in one dimension. Yeah? So D is equal to one. Let's assume that the sequence is ordered so this just uh, improves a little bit our notation. And um, here for the uh, intuition, consider, for example, the sequence that we used when I was discussing the discrepancy. Then we had an elementary method of measuring the discrepancy. The discrepancy is the difference of the volume if it is the star discrepancy from zero to B, yeah, 
And the number of points that fall into this interval from zero to B. Well, if you are in one dimension, volume is just the length of the interval. So my volume is just the length of the interval. We compare this to the number of points that we count in this interval. So there were two different things we have to look at. Volume minus number of points that fall into this interval where the interval is open, yeah, so the x not included. Mm -hmm. These are here the values where we are, say, too large. Yeah. Then if we include the point, so the closed interval, we jump down, yeah, we count the point. I jump down because I have a minus here. We jump down. So then we were taking the absolute value. So then we were taking percentage of points that we count minus the volume. Assume that the discrepancy is attained here in this part where the volume is too large and we have too few points. So that's my second assumption here just for illustration. The other case goes exactly the same. So this means that my star discrepancy is actually given by, well, it only jumps at the points. Yeah? So I only have to look at the points xk. So the discrepancy is given by xk, because that's the place where it jumps. So this is here our star discrepancy in this example. So in this example, it would be, yeah, the largest deviation here, it is the 0.3. Well, we had this example when we were motivating the discrepancy. Yeah, it jumps at a certain k. Yeah, So here in this example, the k would be 3. It jumps at the third point. Well, if you take the open interval, you subtract k minus 1 divided by n. Yeah. So this here is the k minus 1 divided by n. Yeah, because it is the open interval, yeah, the xk is not yet in the set where we, where we count. So this is the xk. Yeah, so my star discrepancy is xk minus k minus 1 divided by n. So here it would be 0 0.7 minus 2 divided by 5. Yeah. So this is 0 0.7 minus 4 divided by 10. This is an 0.3. So if the sequence is ordered, you know that the star discrepancy is attained in this point xk. Uh, and it has this value, xk minus k minus 1 divided by n. So now I define a smooth function f that is 1 shortly before xk and 0 on or after xk. Yeah? So this function is just like that. It's 1 here. Uh, say up to some point that is shortly before xk. Yeah, so there's some epsilon here, and then it is zero. Yeah, of course you know the integral of this function. This integral of this function is just larger or equal xk minus epsilon. Yeah, so this is just this area here that we are integrating. Okay, so this here is the point xk minus, minus epsilon. So the integral of this function is larger or equal xk minus epsilon.
Yeah, then I go smoothly down. Yeah, so I connect now the level one up to xk minus epsilon and the level zero starting from xk yeah, with a smooth function. And what do we have? The integral of my function is larger or equal xk minus epsilon. No, there's a larger or equal now due to this. But how many points do we count for the function evaluation? So if we take a look at the function evaluation, it's f of xi. Yeah, this counts just the points x1, x2, up to xk minus 1. Yeah? Because at xk, the function is already 0. So when we count here, we just have k minus 1 points divided by n. But I know my star discrepancy is xk minus k minus 1 divided by n. So this is the xk minus k minus 1 divided by n. So this is my star discrepancy. So I get that this is d star minus epsilon. Yeah, So large or equal d star minus epsilon. So the part is sharp. Yeah, you see what you actually do is that the function f is modeling this interval that is used in the characterization of the discrep discrepancy. The discrepancy is, um, well, measured yeah, by looking at intervals and comparing the volume to the counting. And the function f yeah, is just, okay, at the boundaries, it's going a little bit down. Yeah, therefore, you have a small epsilon. But the function f is just the indicator function of this interval. So the integral of this indicator function is really associated with the volume, yeah? and the Monte Carlo integral is just associated with counting the number of points. Yeah? So the, the comparison of these two things is exactly doing what the discrepancy does, measuring the volume, count, count the points. So it's quite intuitive yeah, that you can have a, a bound here that is, uh, is sharp, that you have a bound that is sharp. That was it for the cox malafka inequality. Yeah? And we now have a very strong motivation to find a sequence that has a low discrepancy.